Okay, our keynote speaker for today is Robert Forte. Robert graduated from Divinity School at the University of Chicago. He's taught at UC Santa Cruz and was a director of the Albert Hoffman Foundation. <clears throat> He's been involved with Theogens as a student, an activist, a researcher, and an experiencer for 30 years. He has conducted field work with MDMA in the U.S. and with ayahuasca in Peru. The focus of his current research is on the curative properties of cannabis. He is the editor of and contributor to Entheogens and the Future of Religion, uh, a book of uh, the most recent edition of which is on sale in our bookstore. Okay, because we're closed, but um, you know, anytime the bookstore is open. Okay, so Robert, are you here somewhere? Uh, yes, yes, welcome. So Robert doesn't need any AV equipment, he's just going to speak to you today. And uh, after I make sure that this light is not too much in his eyes, he will address you. Robert Forte. So, how's this sound? Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say how um, uh, pleased I am to hear these so many of these talks that we've had just with Veronica and um, Ryan and um, Larry. I've been so bored with what we're, a lot of people in the mainstream media have been calling a psychedelic renaissance and all this appealing to authorities to do research in a paradigm that is really not effective for entheogens. And so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my past and how I got to be here. And I'm just, um, my views have changed a lot since I first got interested in the subject and the three books that I've published reflect this. My first book, Entheogens and the Future of Religion, is a kind of scholarly collection of writings that was um, <clears throat> based on a conference that I organized with Groff in the early 1980s at a time in my life when I thought that if we could just put together enough of the information about entheogens, we could actually affect policy and begin to do legal research. <clears throat> I was taught at the time that the situation with regard to the illegality of entheogens was due to the misadventures of Dr. Timothy Leary. And um, for several years, I carried that in my mind. <clears throat> and then I'm going to get into why I began to reconsider what Timothy was doing. And then I edited and published his Feshrift, his memorial volume, a book of essays, which are written by his contemporaries about what he did and why. <clears throat> And then I began to look at Tim. I, I lived with Tim. I lived at his house during the time that he was dying. And he is, as anybody who's paid any attention at all, a very, very complex and mercurial character. There's not really any way to take one single picture of Tim. The only way to get an accurate sense of who he was is to take a lot of them in kind of a mosaic and kind of spin it around. And so that's what I tried to do in that book. <clears throat> the third book that I published was a reissue of what I think is one of the really most important books in this field called The Road to Eleusis, which was written by Albert Hoffman and Gordon Wasson and Carl Ruck, a classical scholar of Greek mythology at Boston University. And this is an argument that the um, Western civilization, it's well known the first 40 years of entheogen studies, how important entheogens are to the spiritual and healing practices of traditional societies. Not so well known is that these mysterious substances have had a very formative role in the genesis of our own cultures, science, philosophy, and religion. And so I, this was a book that was written in 1978 and went out of print immediately, the late 70s <laughs> being a time when there was almost no mention of entheogens in popular culture or in the university. And so um, <clears throat> I thought it would be important to bring this book back into print and get discussions going about the root, our own entheogenic roots in our own culture. So I thought what I would do for this talk is um, <clears throat> kind of divide it into three sections. The first one being uh, sort of autobiographical, so you can hear my own story and you can see why I've come to the viewpoint that I have and if you want to listen to it at all. The second part, I want to talk a little bit about um, what Leary was really all about, not only Timothy Leary, but Frank Barron, who is almost unknown in entheogen history. 
but was one of my teachers and was Timothy Leary's best friend. And as I was telling Larry a moment ago, you know, a lot of people are unaware that the, the first attempt to popularize psychedelic drugs in our culture, again, the, the uh, ministry, you might say, of Timothy Leary, was actually inspired by Frank Barron, who was his best friend and the guy who turned him on and is one of the foremost researchers into the psychology of creativity. And it was his, his idea that what our culture needed was to excite creativity, not just for artistic sake, but for political reasons. This was a political movement. And the difference between the creative personality and what many psychologists in the 40s and 50s were beginning to research and talk about as the authoritarian personality. And there's a, there's a very big difference between that, whereas a, a creative person, person is aware of the richness of their inner world. They, they are gifted in, in traveling into that inner world, like Larry so, so excellently showed, and bring back these messages. Versus the authoritarian personality, which is one where it has a kind of impoverished inner life. And with an impoverished inner life, there's a tendency to kind of project your power and look outside of you to political structures for, you know, you're, you're obedient, you're conforming. And, you know, many of you here at this institute probably know that the, um, to a very large extent, <clears throat> the discipline of social psychology in this country was formed by refugees of Nazi Europe who had who were either part of Nazi Europe or who observed what was going on, came here to this country and began to do psychological studies on the psychology of fascism, wondering how, how did this happen? How did the German people go from being one of the oldest democracies and one of the most civilized nations in the world to fall into this, this form of fascism? How did that happen? And so there were many seminal figures in the field of social psychology, Solomon Ash. Uh, Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm, Stanley Milgram, who, who conducted extensive research beginning in the late 30s on the American psyche. Students in America <clears throat> began to realize that these tendencies were happening here in our own culture, that America was, becoming, was in danger of becoming uh, like Nazi Germany. And so they directed their researchers toward understanding and articulating these these uh, dynamics. And this is actually where Timothy Leary comes. So, my own story. I was, um, <laughs> Veronica mentioned her mother. I have to give a little nod to my mother here because um, my mother is very Catholic and we had all this same sexual and pharmaceutical prohibitions, but I was, um, I was a little boy, it was about 1967, and near where I grew up there was a stream that I used to go to and play all the time. It was my little paradise, my Eden. And one day I went down there, and this very strange thing happened. I was sitting on the stream, near, near the stream, and I saw a paw print in the sand. <clears throat> it was probably a dog, but I fantasized that it was a bear. And. Um, I had my first mystical experience. I had a, I had a feeling of the, the flowing stream was the blood in my body. The wind that was blowing through the trees was my own breath. The ground that I was sitting was my own body. It was a very brief, fleeting, mystical experience that so excited in me that I ran home to tell my mother. She was taking groceries out of the car. And I said, Mom! <laughs> You won't believe this. I turned into the stream. She kind of looks at me and I said, Mom, when I breathed, the wind blew. She looks at me and she says, Bobby, if I find out that you've been smoking marijuana, that Ricky Scarzello, you're in big trouble. And I thought, marijuana will do that? <laughs> I had no interest in this subject. I was, I saw, oh, I should say this other, this is another, it's kind of strange thing. Not long after that, 
I was supposed to do a report for my fifth grade class. And um, Look Magazine had just, this was 1967, Look Magazine had just come out with this big cover story on LSD, big LSD on the cover. It was my, I had to do current events presentation, so I grabbed that copy of Life of Look Magazine as I walked out the door and went into my class, totally unprepared, and I asked my teacher, what, what is this? What is LSD? What does that stand for? And the only evidence that the 60s ever happened in my town in New Jersey, she said, let's save democracy. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, coming right over my 11-year-old head, I had no idea. And I didn't actually think about it very much until I was in my second year of graduate school and realizing that this is actually was the incentive behind what a lot of these original, particularly, as I said, Leary and uh, Barron. And so, um, but I was, I was really kind of, I used cannabis, but I was really very straight. I kind of fancied myself as a as an athlete and a scholar, and um, weirdly enough, the sport that I focused on was um, the game of golf. Now, I'm, I could be the only person where, for whom golf was a gateway drug, <laughs> because I was, I was interested in learning ways to improve my concentration in this game of golf, and my little brother had gone to a football camp and met Joe Namath, the quarterback of the New York Jets, who was very into transcendental meditation. So my brother said, you should do this. So I learned TM. And my life changed. Just the simple practice of learning to concentrate and calm your mind and make distinctions between what is a distraction and what is actually the focus of your attention it was extremely important. And my life changed. I was a kind of okay student, but I became a straight-A student, and I just kind of grew up intellectually. And so I became very interested in where did meditation come from? Who figured that out? And so I was in my um, second or third year at Columbia University in New York, and I took a course on the history of Indian Buddhism. And the first day of class, our professor was talking about the Vedas, mentions that um, Soma, of course, the Rig Veda, the sacred plant, which is the oldest writings about, uh, about the origin of Indian mysticism. It's all about the Soma. And he mentions that Gordon Wasson, who was actually a banker and an amateur scholar, had written the most convincing uh, work on what was Soma and had concluded to the satisfaction of most scholars that it was this psychedelic mushroom, Amanita muscaria. Well, in that moment, just that recontextualization of what psychedelic drugs were. I mean, I remember sitting there, I was in the front row of the class, and I thought, you mean all that stuff that I've been like putting aside that kids were taking that just seemed to make them weird actually have this important and very dignified history? And so I left the class, and I went to the bookstore, and I started reading everything. I was a very thirsty student and read all the books that were available on this. And, um, <clears throat> and then I moved to California. It was time to move to California. And I enrolled at UCSC. And just by good luck, I was taking graduate courses. And I ran into Frank Barron in a, in a graduate course on personality assessment. And mostly Frank just told stories about his career. And he would constantly mention Timothy Leary. And I thought, Timothy Leary, Timothy Leary, whoa, whoa. And so, um, again, this is, this is now the late 70s. And those of you who are old enough to remember, that was a time when there was, there, psychedelics were kind of absent from our culture. There were no conferences. There, were, there weren't really many books. The Road to Eleusis kind of came and went. There were a few kind of social histories of the 60s, but this was a period where nothing was going on. And so Frank, inspired me to um, do some work in this area. I said I'd be interested in looking at this, and he said, well, why don't you organize a conference? And so in 1981, I, um, with a group of people in, in Santa Cruz, mostly Peter Stafford, who wrote the Psychedelics Encyclopedia, and I, with no money, put together a conference called Colloquium II, the Future of Consciousness Research. And this was a free conference. We sent out a bunch of invitations, and to everybody's great surprise, uh, nearly a thousand people showed up. 
This was a conference. Stan Groff came up from Esalen. Timothy Leary came from Beverly Hills. <laughs> Name somebody. They were there. Hundreds. There were, there were about a thousand spectators and maybe a hundred people came. And I was just astonished that there could be such fantastic interest in this subject that was, again, kind of absent from our culture. And so, again, lucky. Um, Stan Groff invited me to come to Esalen and to go take part in his seminars and be his assistant and he was developing the holotropic breathing and um, I deferred my admission to graduate school and started working extensively with Stan and learning about his whole model and it was a very, very exciting and very, very rich time but it was very impractical as someone looking to start a career so I <clears throat> went to the University of Chicago um, with an idea to use the kind of prestige and gravitas of that school as a, as a springboard to try to reintroduce psychedelic drugs in this kind of scholarly religious model. And, um, and then this very strange thing happened. I was, um, I had a mushroom trip and um, I heard these voices on the mushroom and they said, that I was going to be part of an effort to resurrect a mystery school. I didn't even really know what a mystery school was, but it said that there would that I would be meeting people, and it was I thought being a good Freudian still at that time that this is just my unconscious, you know, telling me I want to do something important like a dream. That was what I was thinking at the time that psychedelics were like dreams, and they would they would magnify what was in your unconscious and like a like a dream what is, a, is interpreted as wish fulfillment. Right? That was the model I used. But then, a month or so after this, I got a phone call from a guy out of the blue who said that he had heard that I was at es in Chicago from somebody at Esalen and that I was interested in sacred plants and I would come up and meet this fellow. I did. And it turns out to be a, a man whose father had just died, leaving him a sizable fortune <clears throat> that was derived from booze. It was the largest bourbon and whiskey <clears throat> distillery and alcohol distribution uh, in the country. And the guy inherited a, a, a large fortune. He called it a moderate fortune. And he was a student at Harvard in the early 60s. And he was, went to law school there. And he was very excited about the importance of psychedelic drugs. And he said to me that it was always his dream to create a psychedelic research institute. <clears throat> and I said, well, perfect. You're the perfect guy to do it. You've got all this money. You're having a midlife crisis. You're a lawyer. <laughs> do it. Do it. <clears throat> well, he said that, you know, when you have this much money, mostly you're just afraid about losing it. And he didn't want to do anything controversial. And so he said, you do it. Now, this is on his sailboat in Lake Michigan that's named Hermes. And, I mean, so something weird's going on here. So I called Stan to find out what was going on. I told him about the sailboat ride and the mushroom trip and all this. I said, Stan, what the fuck is going on? <clears throat> and he said, I don't know. But, <clears throat> but we had, he called Dick Price at Esalen. <clears throat> Dick Price gave us the Esalen Institute, the big house down below, for two weeks for free for Stan and I to organize a conference and to bring together <clears throat> all of the researchers who had done any kind of credible work over the previous 30 or 40 years. And Stan said, I'm going to be traveling, so you do all the work, you can use my name. So I'm thinking, well, this is just incredible. Okay, so I dropped out of graduate school <clears throat> and organized actually a series of conferences <clears throat> that year. And I, um, this little adventure was kind of facilitated by the fact that I had, um, somebody gave me a, a little bit of MDMA, and I was very impressed with that. This is in 1981, I think, or 82. Still legal, of course, MDMA. I wanted to know everything about it. They said, this fellow Shulgin up in Berkeley is the guy to talk to. So I just went up to Berkeley, and after Sasha was done lecturing at UC Berkeley, I introduced myself as a student of this subject, and I had this MDMA, and I understand he knows a lot about it, and would he give me some? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Sasha is in, but he laughed, and he said, no, I can't do that. <coughs> and we talked a bit, and he said, but I can teach you how to make it. <laughs> so... <coughs> When I went to Chicago a year or so after that, I had a, 
I had quite of a nice supply of this legal stuff, and I, <clears throat> as I was going around organizing these conferences, like I organized the seminar at Harvard, and I turned on the Harvard Medical School, I turned on the Medical School at the University of Chicago, I turned on <clears throat> many, many people during this period. And um, one of the reasons that I dropped out of the University of Chicago was because um, Here's, I'm, here I'm going to get into some areas that I know some people are going to find a little unsettling, but I'm going to get into them anyway, that there was, um, <clears throat> I was going to lecture at the University of Chicago on the curative effect of MDMA. I had been giving it to professors and students and just asking them to write, write up what this stuff does. And, um, and then on the day that I was going to give this lecture, May 31st, 1985, um, was the day that the DEA uh, declares MDMA illegal. And they announced that the reason that it's illegal is because there were studies that showed that it caused brain damage, that it caused this depletion of serotonergic receptors in the brain. And the expert on this serotonergic damage was a man named Charles Schuster, who was the head of the University of Chicago Drug Abuse Research Unit. And um, <clears throat> I knew Charles Schuster because I turned him on to MDMA. He didn't even know about the stuff. And now suddenly he's appearing on the front page of all the newspapers in the United States with big headlines, ecstasy declared illegal, and citing his research. I was, I was, I was incredulous. I was about to go lecture to professors and students who I've been giving this stuff to. And now there's this University of Chicago scientist saying that it caused brain damage. I don't know if you've been to the University of Chicago, but they really value their brains there. And, um, and so I went rushing down to Billings Hospital to talk to Charlie, and I said, what, what is going on here? How, how, come, how are you the national expert all of a sudden? What is this business about brain damage? I was, I was kind of upset. And he said, you know, calm me down. He took me back into his office. He said, look, I know you're very upset. He said, let me just try to explain this to you. And with a kind of wave of his hand, he says, look, I have a really nice setup here. The government gives me a lot of money. Sometimes I just have to do what they ask. <clears throat> and so I thought, okay. Hmm. And I just, I, I gave my lecture. I said what he said. I said, we have a problem here. I said, this is actually a, a very interesting and kind of exact recapitulation of what happened with LSD. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, that when LSD first became popular, um, partly because of Leary and many other factors, that there were widely publicized studies that LSD caused chromosome damage. And, and uh, I, I thought that LSD caused chromosome damage. I thought this was kind of scientific knowledge I stayed away from. It until I began to read into the field and realized that there was, in fact, a study done by government-sponsored scientists in the, early, in the mid 60s saying that LSD causes this chromosome damage, but then there were follow-up studies numbering in the hundreds that show that this is complete bullshit, that in fact caffeine causes more chromosome damage in the way that you do these studies, or nicotine, or alcohol, and that this was, a, this was an enormous scam with LSD, and I could see that it was with MDMA as well. And so what happens, and you're probably aware as, as I am, that MDMA from 1985, in the early 1980s, this was a secret stuff. No one had ever heard about it. It was an underground thing, distributed kind of in hushed tones. This is, this is magic stuff. Take it with somebody you love. It's going to, Lester Grinspoon at Harvard Medical School said this is the most important drug that has ever come down the pike in psychiatry. And uh, all of a sudden it was illegal. And with, when it became illegal, within just a few months, it became the most popular recreational drug in the world. <laughs> Billions of dollars made in the MDMA market from, from 85 on, probably still going on. And so um, that, was, that was kind of an eye-opener. I began to shift from my interest in mysticism and the psychology of religion to to back into politics. I had learned that, um, as uh, Ryan showed, I mean, I, as again, I thought that if we could just put all this information down and in showing that not only MDMA, but LSD, psilocybin, 
ayahuasca wasn't really part of the story yet, but these psychedelic drugs, though they're put in Schedule One as having a high potential for abuse and no medical use, this is completely false. <clears throat> in fact, there were many, many studies with psilocybin and, and LSD showing that biologically, these are the safest drugs known to man. And in my Leary book, I have a little thing with Andrew Weil talking about this. So one of the most visible and famous physicians in the world making that kind of statement. This is extraordinary. So not only are they safe, but they have these incredible, unique medical benefits. The very first thing that happened to Frank Barron when he took his psilocybin experience in 1957 was it cured him of what we now would call PTSD. Frank, during World War II, had spent the night in a, in a bombing raid hidden in the carcass of a cow. <clears throat> and ever since then was, was traumatized by this event, one psilocybin experience freed him of all of this blockage, all of this karma that he'd been hanging, and this is when he decided to devote his career to furthering these things. And so um, I became interested in this piece of legislation and in the what a lot of people now call deep politics, others might call conspiracy theory, that we have a kind of explicit governing going on in our culture. We have what appears in the newspapers. You know, marijuana causes schizophrenia, LSD causes chromosome damage. These are all just sort of, it's like Plato's cave. <clears throat> These are the illusions. These are the shadows that are cast on the wall. And there's actually, there are operators behind there that are projecting these images and these memes in order to to manipulate consciousness to serve their own ends. And, and this happens, of course, <clears throat> you know, a great deal with all kinds of military issues, but it's very, it's very easy to see it with regard to drug politics. And so, um, <clears throat> where am I here? What year am I in? I became, <clears throat> this is when I began to pay attention to Timothy Leary and realizing that um, <clears throat> Tim and Frank Barron were inspired to do what they did, <clears throat> partly because they were both approached by the CIA in the early, mid and early 1950s in order to work for them to use their psychological expertise in part of a program that's known as Operation Mockingbird, which is a vast <clears throat> Again, mind control operation on the American people. MK Ultra was a, a specific part using mostly um, psychoactive drugs. Mockingbird is a larger program which involves the infiltration of media, university faculties, and things of that nature. <clears throat> and so, um, Frank and Tim were both World War II vets, Frank more than Tim. Um, but they were very loyal to this concept of democracy and were, were kind of terrified with what they saw underway in America. And so this is why Frank, as I said, went into the study of creativity. It's finding ways to enliven this inner life of, our, of people. And Tim <clears throat> first was doing work on, just generally on authoritarianism, anybody that has looked at his career. You know, his first work was showing that Psychotherapy didn't, the, the model of psychotherapy that was most popular where you had a patient and an authority, the doctor, who would, the patient would say his symptoms and the doctor would just sort of dictate stuff. Frank Tim showed <clears throat> that model didn't work. Actually what worked better was people just getting together and talking to themselves. That the ordinary passage of time, Tim found in his early work, was better. So he was, he was countering this authoritarian model right from the very beginning. <clears throat> and then he, was, uh, he developed a model of the personality that shows a much more complex way of looking at the human psyche. That we're not one robotic personality, but who we are depends on who we're with. And that we, we respond to different situations. So he developed this interpersonal circumplex that was written up in his book, and it was uh, the book of the year in psychology, and it was on the basis of that that he was appointed to Harvard. And then Frank had his mushroom experience and told Tim that this is the thing that we've been looking for. This is not only going to revolutionize American psychology, but it's going to help avert this 
this authoritarian menace that we see now coming <clears throat> upon us. So, um, <clears throat> so I kind of made a decision that I was not going to deal with this stuff anymore, and I began to realize that the most effective way to use entheogens was in this model of a mystery school, rather than try to solicit approval from authorities that had their a whole other agenda, <clears throat> that the best way to do it was to just go back into the underground. And I had this image of a mushroom. You know, when you see a mushroom, it's just the, the part of the mushroom is here above the ground, but actually the mushroom is this vast network underground. And so <clears throat> it would be better, I thought, to further the possibilities of entheogens by, by kind of seeding the underground and not engaging in this uh, debate with authoritarians that aren't going to move. We saw this, for example, with MDMA. People have studied this thing. MDMA, when the DEA announced they were going to make it illegal, we organized um, nearly 20 or 30 of the physicians who had been using it in their practice. The DEA was saying it had no medical use and a high potential for abuse. We produced evidence that had all these medical doctors saying, no, it actually has rather profound medical use and very low potential for abuse. By your own, if you're saying that everybody is using this drug across the country now, there were almost no hospital admissions. And so um, <clears throat> these hearings that took place in LA, Kansas City and Washington, D.C., on the legal, on the scheduling of MDMA, the judge agreed with us and said, you can't put this in Schedule 1 because it has medical use. You have all these doctors and all these patients have come forward with these dramatic stories. It's fairly safe. But the, the way the Controlled Substance Act is written, it's, it's a martial law. The DEA has the authority over the judge over medical experts. So you have, you have police determining medical and scientific policy. And um, I mean, I'm very anxious to see what happens with these, uh, the ones that Ryan mentioned. The ASA has this appeal, but I don't have a lot of confidence that we're going to go anywhere with them. And so, um, That's pretty much how I got to be here. I just, it was, um, <clears throat> it was like an un, unsolicited education with a lot of synchronicities and a lot of really very um, extraordinary experiences. And I'm still trying to figure it out. But um, well, let me hear some questions and I'm going to track here again. to that drug. Have they, have they done any studies as far as you're concerned that really on a microscopic level and um, uh, maybe, you know, radio uh, nucleotide tagging and identification of uh, receptor structures and trans you're, you're asking a question <clears throat> that is out of my expertise. So when I, when I wonder that about the relative safety of MDMA, <clears throat> I ask neuroscientists, and I've been assured that pure MDMA <clears throat> in effective therapeutic doses once a month is not, does not cause any serious damage. <clears throat> that said, I would add that of all the entheogens, it is by far, the, one, the, you know, the top five or six, it is by far the most toxic. <clears throat> the LD, <clears throat> the LD50 of MDMA <clears throat> is still somewhere like around 15, I think, something like that, where, where people have <clears throat> suggested that if you take the LD50 is a is a is a term, with, at which point, what dose, half of the laboratory animals will perish, and so <clears throat> something like 15 times an effective dose with MDMA will cause toxic and possibly fatal reactions. Whereas with LSD, the LD50 has not even been established, or with psilocybin, it hasn't even been established. So, 
<clears throat> Regarding mystery school, do you have a, um, a conception of that that you've articulated at least to yourself or model how that would be? Are you thinking in terms of something with some kind of a uh, political organism or just a structure or simply having it underground so individuals can do it? Or are you thinking something more uh, like a mystery school with some kind of organized teaching or whatever. How, how do you think of that? Well, you know, <clears throat> as we were, as I was listening to the presentations earlier in the day, I was thinking that this is really an example of a mystery school. Okay, you know, the etymology of the word mystery, but I, let me back up a little bit. <clears throat> the etymology of the word mystery, as you probably know, comes from the word mystis, which means to shut the senses, to be silent about. The Eleusinian Mysteries, which I think is an example of the longest running psychedelic cult, went on for 1500 or more years. This was the most considered the most important event in ancient Greece. Um, the initiates were forbidden upon pain of death, or no, 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 they would be banished from Greece. That was the punishment if you ever even uttered something about these mysteries. So this is something that, and for these 1,500 or 2,000 years, there were only a few instances of people violating this code of secrecy. And so, um, <clears throat> and so, uh, Plato's cave story may be an example of this, that here's, you know Plato's allegory of the cave, I trust, where here's a person who has broken out of a cave who then tries to explain to people who have not broken out of the cave what he's seen, and this person is killed. And so, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's kind of easy to apply that model to modern drug use because, first of all, it's very illegal, and we have to know who we can only really talk about this sort of stuff with people who have been initiated. And there's a, there's a kind of the model that I'm suggesting is a kind of hybrid mystery model and that we have an underground community and we talk only among initiates and talking to people who haven't gone through the appropriate stages of spiritual practice given psychedelic drugs very often end up quite confused that these visionary experiences are, are destructive and useful only to people with this training. In fact, let me read this. This is how I concluded this first book. This is one of the oldest Sufi stories. <clears throat> it's called Isa and the Doubters. It is related by the master Jalaluddin Rumi and others that one day Isa, the son of Miriam, was walking in the desert near Jerusalem with a number of people in whom covetousness was still strong. They begged Isa to tell them the secret name by which he restored the dead to living. He said, if I tell you, you will abuse it. They said, we are ready and fitted for such knowledge. Besides, it will reinforce our faith. You do not know what you ask, he said, but he gave them the word. Soon afterwards, these people were walking in a desert when they came upon a heap of whitened bones. Let us make a trial of the word, they said to one another, and they did. No sooner than had the word been pronounced than the bones became clothed with flesh and retransformed into a ravening wild beast which tore them to shreds. Those endowed with reason will understand. Those with little reason can earn it through a study of this account. The Isa in the story is Jesus, the son of Mary. It embodies a similar idea to that of the sorcerer's apprentice. And so, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that we need to... Um, and again, this is, you know, in this current renaissance we're seeing in the mainstream media, a great deal of enthusiasm about the properties of psychedelic drugs. And I can't help but think that this is 
may be part of the same process that we saw in the 60s, although psychedelics were, the more the government tried to repress them, the more they were used. And so I've just wondered with, is, in, in this flurry of press that we see about psychedelic drugs, if you notice this the way I do, that there's a, there's a formula. They say that psychedelic drugs were finding you know, use in our culture in the 50s and in the 60s. But then Timothy Leary came and ruined it for everybody. And um, I'm not sure that's really accurate, that Tim ruined it for everything. Tim was like a guy who discovered a treatment for something that was, and then told everybody to take it. And how is it rational that, the, that there would be a prohibition on research because of, because of a guy's popularizing the effects of them? And so, another question. Yeah. I'm not sure you're in uh, your position now, as you know, the polarity between Aldous Huxley's view of um, giving the material to intellectuals, artists, so, and other such uh, people, as opposed to Leary's more democratic, give it to everybody, and every can't use it even more so. So, is your, your position changed in the middle somewhere in there between those two? Or? Well, again, I'm kind of in the middle of this. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned Huxley because it's, it's kind of well known <clears throat> that Huxley and Leary had different um, intentions. But I think that it's, first of all, important to look at where they're similar. That Huxley also saw American culture going in, a, in the direction of totalitarianism. Okay? And that he and Tim just differed on this one little thing. He thought Tim was being a little too enthusiastic at first. And, um, but they really, they really shared the idea that this could be, the, Aldous Huxley called LSD the atom bomb for the soul. You know? Now, since we mentioned Huxley, I want to also say that um, Huxley's position on drugs is so very interesting because the first thing that Huxley wrote, writes about psychedelic drugs is, is before we even had the word psychedelic drugs, is he writes Brave New World. Okay, this is a this is a very this is a dystopian novel. Everybody knows the novel Brave New World, of course. <clears throat> this is a totalitarian society. Only the people think that they're free. And all of their resources are drained into this vast war machine, and they're really just uh, robots in this in this uh, you know highly technical society. <clears throat> and whenever they get a little anxious, whenever they start to feel their their uh, that they're <coughs> prisoners of this regime, they're they're made to go on what's called a soma holiday. <clears throat> they're given a drug, <clears throat> which Huxley describes when you listen to the descriptions of soma. <clears throat> it sounds like MDMA. It sounds like a drug that makes you feel like everything is okay, even when everything isn't okay. And so this is a, there's a real curious thing to my mind about the all of a sudden extensive popularization of MDMA and this drug being used. And it's it's interesting to me. And here I'm probably going to offend some people again. Is that um, if you compare the political sensibilities of the 1960s psychedelic generation, which was really based on, it was an anti-fascist, anti-war movement, okay? And we, the, the, the young people of the 60s, helped end those, helped end that war, okay? <clears throat> we are now, for the last 12 years, been in the longest and costliest wars in U.S. history. And we have a I'm sorry, I'm disappointed with the response of the body politic to these wars. And I wonder if our culture has, in a sense, been, I use this word, somified in the way that Huxley has, um, you know, Huxley wrote Brave New World in 1937. He wrote Brave New World Revisited in 1951, where he said, I underestimated how fast this would happen to our culture. <clears throat> and if Aldous Huxley was around now and saw, you know, the... And, and then furthermore, just to continue on this, I, I have it on good authority that um, at least one major operation which supplied enormous amounts of MDMA and enormous amounts of LSD, that these people that were doing it were protected by the government. 
And people had told me that they were that it was a, it was a government operation that it had to do with. And you can you can find this stuff out if you want to look into this very disturbing area. Uh, the very well known case of Leonard Picard, who turned the nuclear missile silos into the world's largest LSD laboratory and also MDMA, and there were enormous amounts of LSD and MDMA that got, went through that lab. <coughs> Leonard was, Leonard was like, I knew Leonard, he was serving two life sentences in uh, Leavenworth right now, pissed somebody off. But um, there's uh, someone that wanted to be very thorough about the psychedelic history would look carefully into this. Well, just about um, the idea Just about the idea of the prevalence of soma um, within our culture, Terence McKenna identified it as television, because people they um, return to their homes and they're completely distracted by this glorious, vibrant thing that's um, trance-inducing, and they watch it for hours and hours. And um, you know, the average American consume something like six hours of television a day. And it's, um, it is very much like the summer drug where if you feel lonely or you feel depressed or tired, and you turn on the television and it takes you away from that. It zaps all awareness from yourself and it um, you know, takes away your ability to assess those emotions and to transcend them, which is something that the psychedelic drugs, including MDMA, um, have potential to assist in. So I think that MDMA can't really function um, as soma in that way. I don't think someone would take MDMA and then see the totalitarian, the rise of totalitarianism within American culture or around the world and be okay with it necessarily. I, I mean, that's just my opinion. Yeah, well, you can certainly make a good argument that uh, the way television and the whole popular culture um, is a form of soma. A very important book by media critic Leo Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death, kind of hits on this. But I would take issue with you about um, MDMA, and there's, uh, there's, uh, and I'm, I'm a great fan of MDMA in certain contexts, and been quite involved with it for a long time, while it was legal. And um, uh, I'm not sure. There, are, there, are, there's a kind of, there's a kind of apathy and like everything is okay and these memes that you see in our in the youth culture it's all good well it's not all good actually <laughs> you know it's uh <clears throat> and then you know one particular axe i have to grind or but what i like to bring up i'm very critical or cautious about the widely publicized use of mdma in the treatment of so-called post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans of these wars. Now, <clears throat> I've worked with some PTSD sufferers from these wars, and I, I question the whole category. Anybody that's read Thomas Zaz or R.D. Lang's theories in psychiatry, the myth of mental illness, who I mean, these, these scholars and doctors are suggesting that very often, you know, psycho so-called psychotic symptoms are in fact a sane response to an insane situation. And so <clears throat> when I talk with some of these Iraq War PTSD sufferers, and they s explain what they're going through to me, and that they, they went there to fight for democracy, they were persuaded by all the, the propaganda about whether it's 9-11 or Arab terrorists or all these things which are, you know, blatantly untrue, 9-11 is completely false, that official story. They realize that when they're there, and they're screaming bloody murder. They went over there to fight for democracy, and they're realizing, oh my God, we're the enemy. And this is not only just like a trauma victim, like someone who's been assaulted or raped or something, but this is a whole major shifting of their worldview. We don't want to give these people MDMA and make them feel like everything is okay. We want to give them clear way and give them a stage, let them talk about what's going on there. We need to confront these things, not anesthetize them. Mm -hmm. I want to get started on that. Another question. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Whatever. Sure, I'll, I'll do it. Thanks. <clears throat> Since we're already over here. Um, so I see 
<clears throat> if I have a little bit of a preamble to my question, I apologize. But basically, I think we see something repeat throughout history. And, um, you know, we see that society tends to um, sort of vilify and demify a group of people, systematically take away their rights, maybe incarcerate them or round them up in some way, and, um, you know, dehumanize them. And, and then the politics and, and the media kind of convince the public this is a good idea and we need to be tough on these people and these people are the enemy and creates fear, right? And I think, I think you, know, you know what I'm talking about and um, I can think of many examples, the drug war being one of them. But I don't think we see a uh, guy behind the curtain pushing that forward every single time. I, I think it's something that happens that's inevitable because of the way people think. You know, as a drug policy activist, I've interacted with a lot of politicians that will tell me behind closed doors, you know what, Daniel, I agree with you. But the problem is that they can't exactly campaign on a, well, let's not be tough on drugs, let's be you know, scientific about drug policy stance because it's too long of a sound bite and people will call them soft on drugs. So I think there's something inherent about human nature that drives us, I mean, yes, there's obviously manipulation. You know, I, I definitely agree with you that there are lots of examples in, in, in drug policy and elsewhere where the government has been engaged in manipulation. I think history irons that out because I think a lot of stuff comes out over time as people get older. But it's not all manipulation and do you really think there's a guy behind the curtain pushing it forward? Well, it's complex, of course, you know, and I think that both are going on. I think that there are people behind the curtain who do push it forward and then I think that sociological processes take over. You know, there are a lot of people who are um, uh, unaware, for example, that the um, you know, the cocaine trade and the heroin trade, some very excellent work has been done, important dissertation at Yale, of all places, by Alfred McCoy on the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And that there are billions of, since, since the Vietnam War, since the end of World War II, you know, these, this, um, what scholars might call, my friend Danny Sheehan will call it the secret team, the shadow government. They use, the, the, the drug, the illegality of drugs generates billions and billions of dollars. A Pulitzer Prize winning book by James Mills, The Underground Empire, argues that there's more money in, under, in illegal drugs than there is in oil and in weapons. We talk about the military industrial complex and the power that that has over our culture. But the underground drug business is, according to James Mills, is even more powerful and more money. And so uh, that's one book, The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. The, um, <clears throat> the, the crack cocaine epidemic during the early 1980s, the flooding of our cities with crack cocaine. This is very, this was, it's, it's fairly well established by people that have looked into this, that these are, these are underground operations, covert ops of the U.S. government. Gary Webb wrote some very important books and was suicided because of it. And, um, you know, you just have to look at this, that these are, these are not exactly farcical policies, as uh, Ryan had pointed out, but these are actually very good policies for people to make a tremendous amount of money that's off the books. And so, you know, I think both of those are true. Yes, I think there are people behind the curtains, and I think that there are sociological processes that make it much more complex. Please. Um, I think my question may be similar to the last one. I'm just having a little trouble following the course of the, the talk, and I, I certainly followed you up through the mid-80s and beyond when you were a strong proponent of MDMA. It was being scheduled, and you had tons of doctors describing the benefits of its use. Um, so I'm just something, I'm just not quite clear on how we get from there to your position now where you're very skeptical about seems to me in a way the the establishment coming around perhaps 30 years after you were a strong proponent of it to realizing some of the benefits of I mean I don't want to get into heroin too much or other drugs but the 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 benefits of psychedelic drugs in particular so what what am I missing where does what is your main concern is it the popularity and there's not enough teachers or there's some sort of conspiracy and we're going to be brainwashed by um, the popularization of psychedelics. I, I'm not understanding the, the core mm -hmm. issue that you have. Um, one of the things that is very clear is that with this subject from the, my first introduction to it when I organized this big conference is the incredibly diverse range of people who are drawn to it. Now, 
I, I trust that everybody here in this room is drawn to this subject because we are aware of the, the rich history and the powerful curative and spiritual effects of these substances, and that's why we're here. Um, <clears throat> but the largest user of LSD, Sandoz made a great deal of LSD, and it almost all went to the CIA. And so we've got we've got divergent populations using these drugs. We've got we've got. And even in the underground, I mean, here we are at CIIS. All of us, or most of us, are involved in degree programs. We're training to become healers. We're looking to extend our consciousness in a curative way. There's there's a great deal of drug use that doesn't really have that same set and setting, where people use this substance as um, somebody mentioned spiritual bypass. You know, that's one thing. The the somifying of our culture is another thing. And so, if it's hard to track me, that's because um, there's a lot of nuance here. And, and I don't have a fixed idea about this. I, and this is another reason why I advocate more of a, a mystery school model. And let me, let me put this in here. The, um, the, uh, the Upanishads, okay? Upanishads, who knows what that means? The word means, translates from Sanskrit, Upanishad. Panishad is a to sit near, to sit near, to sit near because what your teacher is saying to you about these mysteries that you are experiencing through your practice are right for you at that time. To advertise about the curative effects of psychedelics in public, to me, is, gets into complications because people might not be ready. It's better to sit near somebody. So, you know, I don't want to make general statements so much about MDMA, and I think that our culture is in a, in a very profound crisis, and maybe in a transformation, I, I don't know. I don't know if that helps me. Well, one of the things I really got from what you're, what you're saying is that the early generation of uh, psych, uh, uh, social advocates of psychedelics, um, you know, of course, uh, Leary and Barron, but also Huxley, to a more reserved degree, we're um, all very committed to an, an anti-fascist project, and that there is a sense that within these uh, medicines, there's some sort of inherent anti-fascist and anti-colonialist, even if you consider the origins of some of these plants, um, uh, inoculative property. Uh, but now I'm also hearing you express a, a degree of reservation uh, about that exuberance um, because of the possibility of a uh, authoritarian colonization mm -hmm. of the properties of these medicines, correct? And yep. that, uh, and that, you know, that was underway earlier to a certain degree, and that even the mainstream, uh, in the absence of social reform, the mainstreaming of these compounds to well, work, to do work with these uh, PTSD victims um, might be a misappl uh, 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 misapplication of some of the possibilities. Right. <clears throat> the drugs, as we know from Norman Ginsberg, who coined the phrase, not leery, set and setting. The effect, of, the effect of the drug depends entirely on the set and setting. And so, <clears throat> if, you know, the, the Third Reich used psychedelic drugs in, a, in an attempt to augment their power. And so when I see, I, I have a newspaper clipping at home where, where uh, you know, one of these scientists is saying, oh, if it wasn't for Leary, you know, we could still do this. And, and Tim wrote in the margins of this article, I am proud to have killed government-sponsored research. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a, if you're in a government-approved project, you, when you take a psychedelic drug, the person that gives you the psychedelic drug acquires a, a very profound kind of legitimacy to you. You are, you are at the mercy of that person. So when... when um, I'm, I'm a little bit critical <clears throat> of drugs being used and authorized by government-approved scientists, when at the same time I become aware that the whole approve, the whole government is that we have a crisis of legitimation, of legitimacy in our in our country, in our world, and that that's does that help you there, Robert? Yes, I, I have to weigh in myself here. Please. <laughs> so, um, as a member of URI, I'm somebody uh, interested in psychedelic research and theogenic research. 
Um, the only way we can conduct that in this country legitimately is by getting a, a site permit from the feds. And so the, the several projects that are ongoing at present uh, with the use of psilocybin largely for end of life issues and like that, um, there seems to be an irresolvable conundrum there where you're obliged to place yourself uh, sort of at the mercy of the government in order to do this good research, uh, but at the same time you become in some sense contaminated by that. Do you have any any way around that? Yeah, thank you for that question because I do. In fact, I, I wanted to, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to set an example myself. Now we have um, you know, in California, it's now legal to grow cannabis for medical reasons, as everybody knows. And so I have um, been thinking that several years ago, I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, I wanted to, I, people had told me about remarkable breakthroughs treating cancer with ayahuasca. And I began to collect stories. I began to bring people to Peru and have them treated with a curandero that I was working with there. And so this is one example. Of you can you, how you can evade the laws and you can you can conduct naturalistic observational research in another country. It's very interesting that here in here in our country, <clears throat> ayahuasca is considered illegal because of the DMT. While in Peru, just a few years ago, and I was speaking at a conference there, they declared Peru declared it a national treasure. <clears throat> and so, and so what I what I thought I would do just to answer your question is um, <clears throat> that here now we can grow cannabis legally. We can sell it more or less legally, share it with members of our collective and receive money from it. And so I was going to design, and we may still do this, design a little program where you can grow cannabis, create your own funding, take people to Peru to be treated with a curandero. You're doing leading edge cancer research. You've got absolutely nothing to do with the federal government. You can write this up. Okay, so that's one thing. And I was also, as you guys are talking about the work that you're doing um, with ayahuasca, you know, we need to like challenge this government. Mm -hmm. We need to do, get busted for the kind of thing you're doing. Go before a jury, have a jury convict you when you're helping people treat their cancer or, or have therapeutic breakthroughs. I mean, that's what it's, that's what it's gonna take. Well, specifically in, in the case of Ebogain, I mean, it's, it's pretty outrageous personal that, story. that Evogaine is, is a Schedule One drug like heroin, supposedly without medical um, worth and highly addictive, when in fact it's the cure for yeah. heroin addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's scarcely a party drug, as anybody who's ever taken it knows. Uh, it's not something you do and then go out for the night. Um, <laughs> See, Ibogaine they put into the Controlled Substance Act. No one had even heard of Ibogaine in the United States. Suddenly it's, it's declared, they probably knew before that of its uniquely effective properties in treating heroin addiction. The last thing that this shadow government wants to do is find an effective treatment for heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. Heroin addiction is what pays their bills. Mm -hmm. So, agreed. Uh, it's, it's awful having police in charge of policy. Um, and yes, the one world government is there, but your, your recommendation for researchers like ourselves is to leave the country and do the research someplace else where it's legal, basically. We're or, or do it underground <laughs> and meet in these kinds of symposiums and keep, talk amongst yourselves and yeah, create what we call a hermeneutical circle and not and just kind of stay low key. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to get clear about the um, um, multi-pronged nature of your critique, and maybe you could help me, and I'm trying to uh, enumerate them and, and, and list them. It seems like you're most concerned about the blunting of the critical potential of psychedelics, um, and that can happen in uh, a number of ways. One, one of the speakers mentioned authoritarian colonization, um, which would, I, I suppose, would be a critique that was formulated by the Frankfurt School originally, not, of course, with psychedelics, but that sort of, uh, of, of, of critique of any kind of uh, a subversive potential in society and how that uh, the um, forces of power can denature that. 
Um, and then you seem to be talking about the um, potential also for blunting of critique through uh, therapeutic models, which, as you use, were anesthetized uh, critical potential, particularly your example being the um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And Can I stop you for a second yes. and ask you to go, explain more what you mean by blunting the critical potential? I'm not sure I follow you. Well, insofar as new perspectives are opened up through, uh, they have the potential to, uh, psychedelics do, to um, uh, profoundly upset one's uh, established belief system. And that's a powerful critique of the status quo. And there are interests that, uh, as, you, as you, I think, very clearly elaborated on, there are governmental interests, certainly, that would like to suppress that. And so that's the blunting of critical potential, if I could use that term. Okay. And, uh, but it's not just from sources from the government, it seemed to be your concern, if I understand you correctly. There is also, then, critical potential gets blunted uh, with well-meaning uh, therapeutic um, practice uh, uh, against in treating post-traumatic stress disorder that normalizes that. The people get and come back with quite, as you said, there is something d deeply wrong with the war. And to come back and to be treated and to be, you know, I'm okay now with my experiences. You get normalized back in society. That seems, that's not directly from the government, but that seems to be a concern. It seems to me a very legitimate concern that you raise. Then I was wondering about um, a third one, which I think I heard you say, and that is a concern that also the powerful critical potential of a psychedelic can be blunted through its um, co-optation into the culture through entertainment for fun value. And therefore it's, it's denatured in what it can actually do. It's sort of contained, and I would be curious, as a sort of side note of your view, uh, this is a big, big issue, but of uh, Burning Man, because there's been that critique of Burning Man, that it does that. And then my last area that I wanted to raise, because you raised the topic of a mystery school, um, uh, you know, there are some self-proclaimed mystery schools. I don't, uh, I'm thinking of the one by Jean Houston, for example, that does not promulgate psychedelics. But, I mean, she's got a, uh, you know, you pay, you pay, you pay. You've got all these, so I'm wondering about the capitalist uh, way of co-opting and uh, denaturing what a mystery school might actually be. So um, I'm wondering if, if that is, <coughs> in your comments on that, if I'm just mixing up all different categories and you didn't really say what I thought maybe you're, mm -hmm. you're aiming at. Yeah, I'm trying to think how to respond in a brief way. I mean, I think that it really does have to do with set and setting. <clears throat> and what Jean was doing with the mystery school is, it, it, it is a, there's another wonderful phrase by the, by the intellectual Morse Berman, the commodification of dissent. And that's another critique that I have about, again, this modern sort of emergence, and that, uh, again, psychedelics, when they first became popular in this country, were very much tied in with these memes of questioning authority, think for yourself. It was an anti-war movement, fundamentally. Now the memes are something different, the kind of subtle, the set and setting that the mainstream media is, is, seems to me to be kind of putting out there is completely lacking this anti-war um, component, anti-authority. In fact, what they're doing is actually affirming the authoritarian model of the Controlled Substance Act. And by, by the, a government legitimizing psychedelic drugs, in a sense, legitimizes itself and gives the illusion, I mean, if you've ever read Herbert Marcuse, and I have a feeling you have, <clears throat> then you know that one of the tricks that totalitarian societies use in order to appear like they're not totalitarian societies is to, um, one of Marcuse's sort of cumbersome phrases is um, repressive desublimation, in which, and again, Huxley, Huxley wrote about this in Brave New World, if you are, if you are subjects are getting late all the time and having entertaining experiences distracted, they're not going to rebel against their captors. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we'd have a long conversation about this. I can't, <clears throat> and I, I um, when I arranged these marks, I, I meant, I know they're just sort of like staccato. I meant, I wanted to provoke some stuff like this rather than just, you know, telling you my story. I wanted to get into some fights. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
I have a question about um, entheogens and psychedelics. I really celebrate them, but I'm also really afraid of them. Good sign. <laughs> and um, I watched the Spirit Molecule documentary, and Rick Strassman, I think, said that the reason he stopped doing the research with participants was because we, he was kind of pushing people off a cliff and then wasn't quite taking responsibility for how these people were going to reintegrate this this um, awakening into into their normalized linear reality and um, and then the fact that it's illegal creates this kind of paranoia or, or stigma that you have to deal with when you come back to the normal society um, I would like to be more involved with entheogens, but I'm not sure that I can reintegrate what goes on out there into my linear... When you say out there, you mean in your experiences? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah in the, I don't know if they're out there or in there, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they feel like they're out there, but they're in there too. There's maybe no out there or in there, period. But, um, but I guess my hesitation is that because it is illegal and because I don't, other than friend circles, I wouldn't really know how to reintegrate the lessons learned or the teachings or the information that I've garnered from uh, the experience back into a day-to-day -day functional productive reality. So I guess I'm just putting that out there as where I am as an issue. Yeah. Um, and how would you recommend maybe uh, growth in that area? Well, I'd recommend hanging out around CIIS a little bit. And, um, and I don't know about you, but I have confidence in the path that you're on and that I would just um, be patient and it takes a while. And you're not going to get any fast answers to this, but you have a, you have a natural intelligence and an inquisitive mind and a, and a very... Uh, wise caution, and so those are good tools to advance a little further on this. You know, Rick is a is an old friend of mine, and a very very highly ethical and moral guy. And he went through hell, when, you know, after getting I was you know I almost did a PhD with him on that project, and we talked about this a lot between the Buddhist community that he was part of, <clears throat> uh, giving him shit for doing this. And then the responsibility that he felt for, as you say, guiding people into these very, very unusual realms. In a set and setting, I personally think that was not really conducive to a kind of integrated sacred experience, but a set and setting that would encourage a lot of bizarre stuff like, you know, he's got all these insectoid stuff and people feeling like they're part of being probed and a lot of the kind of abduction phenomena appears in his well, for God's sakes, if you're strapped in a hospital room in bed, you got tubes out, you got sticking stuff up your butt, of course you're going to have these kinds of experiences, you know? And Rick was much more relaxed about guiding people in DMT trips in a less formal, government-approved context. So. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank Robert for presenting for you. And thank you all for coming. Erie would like to present Robert with this little token of our appreciation. It's Cusy. And we hope to have Robert back in the future for a, a re-engagement. Um, we would like to point out to you that one of Erie's primary focuses is on integration of experiences. This is one of the things that we do. It is certainly a very important issue.